Hi, everybody. Welcome back to another Mr. Farney video. In our last video as part of our plate tectonics unit, we focus on Alfred Wegener and his studying of continental drift. In this video, we're going to kind of get the second piece of our plate tectonics equation, focusing in on C4 spreading, talking about Harry Hess and the technology he used to help discover mid-ocean ridges. We'll learn our first two rock types for our geoscience class here. We'll talk a little bit about paleomagnetism. What does that have to do with trying to figure out the age of rocks on the seafloor? And we're going to finish it off with a short discussion about how this entire process is driven and why maybe it was so difficult for Alfred Wegener to really prove that mechanism for continental drift. So first things first, what is seafloor spreading? What's the main idea? The main idea is that we have oceanic crust forming at mid-ocean ridges, and they are becoming part of the seafloor. That's the idea. We're creating new crust. We're making new rock material deep, deep, deep underwater, under the ocean water, at these really elongated volcanoes is a really good way of thinking about that. It's this one mountain chain that skews all the way across the middle of the Atlantic, thousands and thousands of miles with a little opening where magma can come up from the mantle, it cools, it forms new rock, and then it slowly spreads out. That's the idea of C4 spreading in a nutshell there. Before we get too deep into it, we need to at least establish this idea of paleomagnetism. What is paleomagnetism? That sounds like a really big science word. Don't worry, we'll break it down. It's the study of Earth's magnetic record using little tiny iron bearing minerals that are found in rocks and that we can use to figure out what the orientation of Earth's magnetic field was at one time or another. Why is this important? It gives us a little bit of symmetry when we're trying to age how old the rock material is on both sides of our mid-ocean ridge. So that's a lot I know. We'll come back to this in a second. Uh, one little extra thing that you do want to keep in mind is that every so many thousand years or so, the Earth's magnetic pole does flip. You might have heard about it in the news that everybody's worried that when the Earth's magnetic pole flips, something bad is going to happen. I don't think it's going to be as, you know, big of a thing that, that they're really worried about. If anything, it might just mess with some species migratory patterns and things of that nature. So don't freak out about it. It's okay. It happens every thousands of years or so, and animals are still here. So that's okay. What do you have to worry about this right now, paleomagnetism? Just keep in the back of your mind that every so many thousands of years, the Earth's magnetic field flips, the North Pole switches to the South Pole, and that we can record that new orientation in little tiny iron bearing minerals that we can find in rocks. That's what you just have to focus on right now. Little bit of background. How did we figure out the seafloor was actually spreading? We have to go back to 1960. That sounds right now like a long time ago, but in the grand scheme of things, it was only about, oh, 60 years or so ago where we actually had this professor from Princeton University, his name was Harry Hess. He was a World War II veteran that he helped to develop the technology for sonar during the war to help you know, locate German U-boats and things like that. So this is a war technology that was then con con continued to be developed and utilized in other facets beyond that of scope of World War II. One of which that Harry Hess did here, he focused a lot on mapping the topography of the ocean floor. During his time in World War II and then past that, he recognized that the ocean floor, it wasn't totally flat that like some people thought it was before. There's a slew of different elevations and topographies and mountain ranges that are found underneath that cascading water of the ocean surface that he wanted to map. He used his sonar technology in order to do so, and it was on one of his expeditions that he discovered that there was this ridge in the middle of the ocean where something really fascinating was occurring. So Harry Hess plays a really important role in this entire story, so we need to be able to recognize him for that. He found all these underwater mountain chains that kind of threaded around the surface of the earth, almost like uh, seams on a baseball with various thicknesses, depending how far 
that rock material was from the center of those ridges. The further you go out from the mid-ocean ridge, it gets thicker and thicker with the distance, which makes sense because the longer the rock material has to sit on the bottom of the ocean surface, more stuff can slowly start piling upon it, almost like layers of dust. Or in this case, it's different types of extra sediment that kind of slowly builds up over time. So again, we can use that kind of paleomagnetism a little bit, and we, be, we can start aging how old this material is relative to each other. So how does seafloor spreading actually work? How does it occur? Very, very simple terms. We have lava that comes up from the mantle. It comes through the middle of our mid-ocean ridge. As that really, really hot lava touches the water, it cools into rock, and that rock slowly spreads out. At the edges of different plate boundaries, we have our seafloor crust actually being able to start going back underneath our continental crust, remelting, and kind of starts this whole process again. So at mid-ocean ridges, we have crust formation. At deep sea trenches, we have crust destruction. That's very important thing to keep in mind with this process of seafloor spreading. We have magma rising up. It fills the gaps of our mid-ocean ridge, solidifies, creates new seafloor. That's seafloor spreading. Tying that back into our paleomagnetism or magnetism concept that we established earlier, the magnetic field, it reverses every few thousand years. So don't freak out where we have you know, them talk about magnetic reversals and things like that. All it is, is that it's a change in the polarity between north being north, where it is, where we like to think about it, to south being south. That's why some places you'll hear scientists refer to as the geographical north, which is, you know, what we like to think of up toward Canada and the North Pole where Santa lives, and the geographic south down south in Antarctica, and, you know, in areas where there are penguins and stuff like that. Magnetic north, it's not exactly the same as geographic north because it undulates with this magnetic reversal. So depending where magnetic north is, is going to dictate the orientation of these iron minerals in our rocks. That allows us, if we look at the pictures on the right, we can see that there's this very symmetrical pattern that forms on opposite sides of our mid-ocean ridge as it slowly begins spreading apart. You can see one orientation is colored red, another orientation is colored white or that gray color there. As more magma forms and it cools, it slowly spreads out. And you can see how the left side of our mid-ocean ridge, we have the, the white right next to each other in the middle. And then the next layer out, we have red on opposite sides of that. Since that red orientation, we know has those iron filings both pointing toward the same direction, we know that this red section on the left is the same age as the red section on the right. Why would I care or why would I need to know the orientation of these minerals or paleomagnetism or any of this? It helps scientists to relatively date other things that they could find in rocks. Maybe they find a fossil in this left material on the right of one organism. And maybe they find a fossil of a second organism in the red on the right. This can tell them then, well, if both of these red sections were formed in the same period of time, both of these fossils, these two different organisms, likely lived during the same period of time. So you can get a lot of really interesting aging information out of paleomagnetism and looking at these iron minerals and rocks. If anybody's ever played with any of these little like metal filing magnetic things, uh, like you've seen in the picture here before, this looks like it's straight out of 1950, it's the same idea. You're able to manipulate the iron filings in this or in an Etch-a-Sketch with a magnet, depending, you know, you're using uh, a magnet that's like north oriented, south oriented, all that fun stuff. Isochrons, this is just another term we're adding onto it. If we were to draw an isochron map, this is a map that scientists use 
that can help determine the age of the seafloor. Remember, it takes a long time for continents to move. We established that in our last video with Alfred Wegener. Centimeters a year, it's the rate in which your fingernails move. So if I look at this picture here, you can see that the age of the crust, as we slowly move away from the mid-ocean ridge here in the middle, this is millions of years old. But the leftmost yellow section here where it says Gilbert, we can assume based on this picture that not only was the polarity reversed, but that crust material is probably close to 5 million years old. On the right side, it's the same. The polarity is reversed. We can kind of count out in sections based on that polarity flip because we know roughly how long it takes for Earth's polarity to flip. And we can say the right side is also from the Gilbert section. It's also 5 million years old. So these isochrons, these lines that we could draw on maps, they point to the same age of the same formation time of these rocks to help scientists determine the age of the seafloor. This is just another picture that's showing the same thing. Mid-ocean ridge, these deep gray areas, they are the same age. New crust comes in and form this lighter gray section. That's our new crust. Those two dark gray areas that have been pushed to the side, they're still the same age. If I had even newer crust come into form, an even lighter gray, this lighter gray, they're the same age. The slightly darker gray on both sides, they're older crust, but they are of similar age. And then the deep darker gray, that's even older, older crust from our first image. They're still the same age, even though they're so far apart from each other. So the symmetry that we can get by looking at the seafloor on both sides of our mid-ocean ridge, using paleomagnetism as a guide provides scientists a lot of really good evidence on how to age the seafloor. We can glean a lot of really important information uh, based upon that info. So what is the mechanism that Alfred Wegener could not prove to kind of gets this whole story going. Why do plates actually move? It has to do with this thing called the asthenosphere. Now, I know in past science classes, you might have had, you know, your teachers just call it the mantle. You might not have broken it up into different sections, but there's three that we're going to kind of care about right now. The very, 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 very top layer where you and I exist is called the crust, okay? Underneath the crust, we can break up our lithosphere. There's a word that, you know, we've used before in our science class already, the lithosphere. We can say that the lithosphere is the top layer of the mantle. Lithosphere has two components that we care about. We have the oceanic lithosphere and we have the continental lithosphere. The oceanic, the oceanic lithosphere, it's made out of a rock called basalt. It's generally a very dark color rock it's very heavy and it's very dense. And because it's very heavy and very dense, it makes it very, very thin. Right here on this picture, it's dictated by this brown thin layer that's very horizontal in orientation. That is our basalt layer. That's our oceanic lithosphere, our oceanic crust. Next to it, that kind of puffs out almost like a marshmallow, that's our continental portion. That's our continental lithosphere. That's our granite. That's a light, dense, less material that you might have in your kitchen as a countertop. It's very prevalent. So granite is much less dense. It's much lighter than our oceanic lithosphere. If you ever put an ice cube in water, beyond the nature of hydrogen bonds and things like that, we can just say that the ice cube is less dense than the water. So it floats on top. It's the same idea when it comes to, you know, continental lithosphere interacting with oceanic lithosphere. This continental crust, it's going to float on top of the oceanic. So when they come in and they meet, if they're being pushed into each other, the more dense oceanic lithosphere is going to sink underneath our continental lithosphere. That basalt is going to sink underneath the granite. That oceanic crust is going to sink underneath the continental crust. And it's that orientation, it's that interaction that really starts driving this idea 
of convection movement and convection currents. So within the asthenosphere, that's the second layer of the mantle, lithosphere, asthenosphere. Remember, our asthenosphere, it's not fully liquid. It's like almost a putty-like material that you can like move around and manipulate, but it's not solid and it's not liquid. It's like an in-between kind of phase position. Within the asthenosphere are these large, slow-moving convection currents that are driven by this interaction of our oceanic and continental crust. As the material from our oceanic crust, it goes in to our asthenosphere, it's cold. It begins by being a cold temperature. That rock is not molten. But as it sinks and goes deeper, it starts to heat up, it starts to melt. And it's that interaction of cold rock, hot magma that really begins to drive our convection currents. Maybe you have a convection oven at home where it circulates the air within the oven. It's the same idea. You have some material that is rising because it's hot and sinking because it's cold. It's expanding and rising. It's contracting and sinking. And it's that interaction that's really driving these convection currents within our asthenosphere, within our mantle. And we can see right here, these big red convection cells. You'll notice they're going in opposite directions. On the left-hand side, it's going counterclockwise. On the right-hand side of the ridge, it's going clockwise. And you'll notice that our oceanic crust, it's moving the direction that our convection cells are moving. We can see that by the arrows being dictated on opposite sides of our ridge here. So our convection cells are driving the direction that our oceanic crust is moving. As that oceanic crust moves and it subducts underneath our lithosphere, underneath our continental lithosphere, underneath our granite, underneath our continental crust, as it subducts or goes underneath it, that cold material, it sinks, driving our convection current in this direction. On the left-hand side, it's counterclockwise. As that material sinks, it'll begin to melt because it gets closer to the core where temperatures are hotter. That material moves back then toward our mid-ocean ridge right underneath it where it begins getting really, really, really hot. And as it begins getting more hot, the temperature increases, that material begins to upwell or goes back toward the surface. And then it reemerges at our mid ocean ridge as lava. And that lava begins to cool into newly formed basalt. So there's a lot going on in this section. And we can see how it was so difficult for Alfred Wegener to even maybe even conceive this notion based on the fact that he was limited by the technology of his time. And they thought that the interior of the earth was just solid rock. So this is all really fascinating if you think about it, all the different mechanisms that are coming into play and how this interaction because of density changes really drives this whole mechanism of convection currents, of upwelling, of mid-ocean ridges and of sea floor spreading. So hey, that was a lot to unpack from this video. I encourage you to go back because it probably warrants a second viewing. If you have any questions, please let me know. And hey, have a great rest of your day and I'll check back with you next time. Bye-bye.